Today we're going to take a dive into Unity 6.2's World Space UI. You can see on the screen here I've got Scene View open. It'll look a little bit different in Game View, but I just wanted to give an overall picture of what we're going to build. As you approach an enemy, World Space UI will fade into place. You can interact with it on a drop-down menu or clickable buttons, and you can move around and interact with all the creatures in the game as you get close to them. So the end result should be a nice, satisfying, and professional-looking World Space UI, and should give you some ideas of how you can implement this in your own project. Let's get into it. Getting started with World Space UI is really simple. All you have to do is create a canvas, and in the inspector, you can set its render mode to be World Space. You also have to give it a reference to a camera, but we're going to do these things programmatically today. We're going to focus on UGUI today, but you can do the same thing with UI Toolkit if you change the render mode of your panel settings asset to World Space. Now, here in my scene, I have an enemy prefab and nested underneath the enemy prefab, I already have another prefab, which is a canvas with the render mode set to world space. Underneath that, I've got some buttons and a drop-down menu. We're going to look at all of these things a little bit closer in the video, and we're going to be configuring all of them with code, not with clicks. So to give you an idea of what we're shooting for, let's jump into play mode. So the general idea here is when the player is close enough to an enemy, the world space UI should appear, we want it to be interactable. We want it to point towards the camera or at least in a direction that we can use it from. And we're gonna add some additional effects to it and make sure that it's always inside the camera view. So we'll build these things up incrementally throughout the video. Let's come out of play mode and I'll strip down the world space UI to the bare minimum. So basically we'll just have the world space canvas, a panel and nested under that we'll have one button. That'll be enough for us to get started as we build things up. Let's jump into Rider. I've created a new file here for the enemy world UI, which is a mono behavior. This class will contain all the logic we need to control the world space canvas that's attached to each enemy prefab. So let's start by setting up some references. We're going to need a reference to the canvas, of course. Let's also keep a reference to the button that's on the canvas. Then let's have another section for behavior. We'll keep a reference to the player's transform, and we can also keep a reference to the camera. Then I'm going to set up the interactions with each enemy through a trigger. So let's have a trigger radius for that. Of course, we're also going to want to keep a reference to that trigger. In our start method, if we haven't assigned a player in the inspector, let's find it by tag. Likewise with the camera, if we haven't assigned one in the inspector, let's just use camera.main. For the trigger, let's use our Unity Utilities get our add method to make sure that we have a sphere collider on this object. Let's set it to be a trigger and let's set its radius to be whatever we've configured in the inspector. Now, when this script is enabled, we need to make sure that we actually have a reference to the canvas. If not, let's log some kind of error and bail out early. Obviously, we can't really continue. If we do have a reference to the canvas, we can programmatically make sure that its render mode is set to world space. Then we can set its camera and we can start with it deactivated. Whenever I have an on enable method, I like to add an on disable, even though we don't have any logic for this yet. I'll just leave it as a placeholder and we'll add some logic later in the video. Now let's create a special method for every time we want to actually show the world space UI. Now we're starting dead simple. When we show the UI, we're just going to set it to be active. Likewise, let's make a hide UI method where all we're doing is disabling the canvas. So that'll isolate the logic for showing and hiding the UI. But let's have an on trigger enter method where first of all, we can check to make sure that it's the player that entered the trigger. And if so, we'll show the UI. Then we can have an on trigger exit where we do the same check. And this time, if it's the player leaving the trigger, we hide the UI. So that's not a lot of code, but it's still more than one page worth. In Rider, if you come up to the main menu and go under code, you can come down under folding. And here you can collapse everything down to definitions really quickly. Very useful as your classes start to get a little bit bigger. So back here in Unity, I've added that script to my enemy prefab, and I've dragged in references to my canvas and my button. Let's hit play and see how it looks so far. Well, it disabled as soon as the enemy wandered away. But if we come over to the enemy, it should appear again. Yeah. And right now we can tell it's just aligned with the enemy's direction. So that's not super useful for us. And in fact, right now, it's quite difficult to interact with the panel because he keeps moving it around. And not only that, but now he's spun around completely, so I can't even click the button. So lots of room for improvement. So let's tackle these problems one at a time. The component on the enemy that's making it wander around is called the enemy mover. So let's keep a reference to that. And in our start method, we can grab that component from the game object. 
The enemy mover exposes some public methods that we can use. First of all, we can stop it from wandering around by using the pause method. And when we're done with our UI, we can let it resume. Now, when it comes to the direction that the canvas is facing, let's come all the way to the top of the class. We'll define a new enum called facing target, where we'll have three different choices. For now, we'll focus on making it face the camera, and we'll set that as the default choice in a public facing field. Since we're going to define three different ways to direct the canvas, we could store that logic in an action. I'll just call it target action. This way, every late update, we can say as long as the canvas is active and we have a target action, let's invoke it. So what might one of those actions look like? Well, let's define a method here called face camera. First of all, a guard clause. If there's no canvas and there's no camera, there's nothing to do. Otherwise, let's figure out the direction to the camera and we can use look rotation to set the rotation of the canvas. Let's have another method that will allow us to update that target action. We could just use a switch here. We could say if we've selected facing target dot camera, we want to use the face camera method. Since we haven't defined any others, we'll just default to null. Then we can call this switch right from the start method. And that's all we have to do. Let's make sure that it's working. Straight into play mode. Let's move away and come closer. The enemy should stop roaming around and the panel should always face the camera. So that's looking good. Notice that it's rotating up to face the camera a little bit. I don't know if I like that behavior so much. It might be hard to tell in the video, but my mouse is also tied to the orbiting of the free look camera. So when I go to press the button on the panel, the camera view shifts and that makes it a little hard to actually click anything. So let's solve that annoying problem. I'm gonna have a new section here for Cinemachine. Here we can have a reference to the Cinemachine input axis controller. In the start method, we can find a reference to that component because it's nested under the player prefab on the free look camera. Then if we come down to our show and hide methods, all we have to do is either disable that controller or enable it. Of course, just like all the features we're gonna to add today, you can make this more robust if you're having to handle multiple enemies, multiple panels. But for now, this will disable the orbiting of our free look camera whenever the panel is visible. Now, when we enable this component, let's check to see if we've got a reference to the button. If we do, let's remove all listeners. Then let's add a listener to the onClick event that will just log something to the console that includes the name of this component. Quick sanity check. Let's make sure that orbiting stops. Yep, looks good. And what happens when I click the button now? No problem. We can see we're getting a few messages out in the log here. So that's a little bit more user friendly, I think. If I move away, I should be able to start orbiting the camera again. So as soon as the canvas becomes hidden, we should be able to start orbiting the camera again. Looks good. So we had two other facing options to implement. The first one was to face the player. Here we can have a guard clause that says no canvas or no player return. Otherwise, let's find the direction to the player and then we can use vector three dot project on plane. This will make sure that we've got no pitch and no roll just a flat direction straight towards the player. Then we could have another guard clause that says if that square magnitude is less than or equal to a very small number, then it's not really necessary to perform any logic. Let's just bail out. But if it's a significant change, let's update the rotation. Now the hybrid approach will be similar to the face player, but I want it to face the camera without any pitch or roll. So let's check for canvas and camera. Then we'll find the direction towards the camera, but flat. Again, we'll check against K epsilon, and then we can update the rotation. Up above in our switch statement, we need to account for these. Let's add two more cases to the switch. Now let's add an update method so that we can actually change this at runtime. So we're starting off here in the camera facing mode. Obviously, it's tilting up towards the camera. Let's switch the face target to be the player. As soon as I change it, we can see that there is no more pitch or roll. It's just going to point directly at the player. Now. That's not exactly convenient, especially if I go behind the panel, it turns around so that I can't even click anything. So maybe a hybrid approach would be a little bit better. This way, the canvas would always point straight ahead and never really rotate. I guess it probably depends what type of camera and what type of game you're actually building. At least now we have some options to choose from. The panel's stable in the world and easy to click. So why don't we add the dropdown? Today, I'm just using a simple Text Mesh Pro dropdown. Let's define a few options as an array of strings. For now, I'll just default to three, but of course we could add more in the inspector. Now I'll just control end all the way down to the bottom of the file. Here we can set this up in the on enable method. First of all, let's make sure that we have a reference to the dropdown. And if so, let's see if its template is set. 
If it isn't, let's find the object that I've defined as template and we'll set it into that public field. Then let's make sure that the template is inactive. We want to remove all listeners from its on value changed event, and then we can clear all of its options. Now for each of the dropdown options that we've specified in the inspector, let's add it as new option data into our TMP dropdown. Then we can add a new listener to the dropdown so that we output the name of this component and the text of the particular option that was fired. Then with our setup complete, let's call the refresh shown value method. If you've never made a dropdown menu in UGUI before, SpeedTutor has a great beginner's tutorial that explains the general structure. But if I expand my prefab here in the hierarchy, you can see where I have a game object named template, and underneath that I've got a viewport, content game object that has a vertical layer group, and then below that a sample item. The dropdown component clones this template and fills it out with whatever options you might have specified here in the inspector, but for us we've done it programmatically in code. So let's hit play and see how it looks. Might have to get a little bit closer here so that we can see it nicely. If I click it, we can select an option and then we'll see that option output into the console. So that looks pretty good and required minimal effort on our part. You can see too that when I roll the scroll wheel, it moves everything up and down a little bit. We know that's working as well. I would have to change the constraints of that vertical layer group a little bit for it to, uh, to kick in. And of course, I haven't configured any scroll bar. But hey, drop downs in world space, that's pretty awesome. I can see this being extremely useful for doing things like configuring RTS units, things like that. So one thing that's been bothering me a little bit though is that the panel keeps going off screen. Since I'm using Cinemachine, we can make use of the Cinemachine target group. Now the way that a target group works is that you can assign a weight and a radius to each of the objects in the group. Now we don't want jarring transitions in and out of the group, so what we're going to do is lerp this a little bit so we can keep track of target weight, current weight, and the weight velocity. We can do the same thing for radius. I'm going to move the input access controller to the top of this section and we're going to add one more field and that's so that we can track the index of this canvas inside the target group. Now let's head down to the on enable section again. Here let's say as long as we've got a target group and we've got a canvas, we can add this canvas as a member and we can start it with a weight and a radius of zero. Then we can zero out all of our values for lerping and we can get the index of the canvas inside the group by using the find member method. Now we're going to need a bit of code in our on disable method. First of all, anytime we disable, let's make sure that we hide the UI. But beyond that, let's have the same target group and canvas check. Here we want to remove the member from the target group and we'll set our target group index to minus one. So that gets the canvas in and out of the target group, but it doesn't do anything about handling lerping. If we come up to our show UI method, here we can set our target values equal to whatever we've set in the inspector. When we're hiding the UI, we want to set those target values to be zero. Then we can introduce a new method that will actually apply these lerped values. First, a guard clause. If there's no target group, there's nothing to do here. But otherwise, let's get the target group index. If we haven't cached it yet, we can use the find member method again. If it's less than zero, like we've set it to negative one, just return. Otherwise, we're good to go. Let's get a reference to all of the targets in the group. Then we'll find our specific reference using our index. We can set its weight and we can set its radius and then we can put it back into the collection. After we're done modifying the collection, we assign that back into the target group targets. Finally, let's make sure that we cache that reference for future use. Now let's come down to where we defined our update method. Right now it's an expression body. Let's change it to statement body. Here in update every frame, we can calculate what the lerped value should be. So we can say as long as there's a target group and a canvas, we can calculate our current weight using smooth damp, and we can do the same for current radius. Then we call that method we just wrote to apply the values every frame. So this should give us some nice smooth movement in and out of the target group. My target group component is sitting here with all my cameras and lights. It has the Cinemachine target group component on it. I'm going to drag a reference to that target group into the enemy component. And I think for the group weight, just to make sure it's really pronounced, I'm going to change it from 0.25 to be 1 in the weight and the radius. Now, when I go into play mode here, we should see the camera adjust to accommodate the world space UI and the player inside the camera viewport. When I come out, it should just focus on the player. So that looks pretty good. The transition's a little bit fast, maybe. Uh, I guess that's debatable. Let's try inching away from it a little bit. That was a little bit fast. Let's try it one more time. Yeah, it's a little bit fast, but you know what might make it look really good is if we faded it in and out. To handle the fade, we're going to need reference to the canvas group. I've got one on the same game object as my canvas. 
Now we're going to run a little bit of logic as we're fading out. So let's have a Boolean to say that we're running the fade and we could have a float to determine the smooth time. Now, because we're going to lerp this as well, just like we did with the target group, let's have a target value, current value, and the velocity. I'll add a few more headers in here as well, just to clean this up. Now let's jump down to our familiar on enable method here, right after we get a reference to the canvas, it'll be super easy for us to get a reference to the canvas group. Now, if we have a canvas group, we can zero out all of those values and we can set the alpha to zero. We can make sure that it's not interactable and that it's not going to block raycasts. Now, when we show the UI and hide the UI, we're going to do some extra logic. First of all, showing the UI means we want to set our target alpha to one. But in hide UI, we want to set it to zero. And here, when we're hiding the UI, we want to set that pending hide flag to be true because I don't really want to execute these first three statements of logic until the canvas is completely faded away. Let's remove them for now. Now let's move over to our update method where we can handle this fade logic. Let's say if we have a canvas group, we can lerp the alpha just like we were doing with the target group. Then we can set the canvas group's alpha to be that value. Now we probably only want to interact with the panel as long as it's at least 50% visible. So we could set the interactable and the blocks raycast values based on that. Now, if we're in the process of fading out, we want to know when we should run that additional logic. So let's calculate when the alpha should actually be done, meaning that we have a canvas group and that current alpha is very close to zero. If that's the case, then that logic I cut from the hide method could be performed here, meaning we deactivate the canvas, the enemy can resume moving around, and we can re-enable our Cinemachine controls. Then finally, let's toggle the flag off. Well, nothing to do here except go into play mode with control P. Well, it faded in, but that might have been too fast to even notice. Let's move in and out of range. Well, I think I really like that functionality with the fade and the target group combination. 15 minutes of effort and it looks pretty professional. Let's come out of play mode and I'm going to add some UI effects that I have from the asset store. When it comes to UI effects, CamGam is one of my favorite publishers and I've added their UGUI blur and I've added their animated buttons here as well. Mostly just to see if they work in world space and of course they do. They make these effects for UI toolkit as well. So I'm just going to toggle them on and then we can jump back into play mode and see how it looks with a little bit of effects. So the animated button looks pretty cool. And you'll notice that I put a blur image right behind the panel. It might be a little hard to tell if I come to that component and come down to the strength. I can turn it all the way up or scale it all the way down, at which point it's actually doing nothing. Let me scroll down in the inspector here and find it. There we go. So I'll turn it all the way up. Now you can hardly see anything. But at zero, you can see right through. I really like how these things just work with no modifications. Let's just make sure they still work when I move around. Yeah, they even work with the fade. Looks great. I'll leave a link in the description to the CamGam publisher page. They have bundles for UI Toolkit and for UGUI. So everything is working great. The drop down works, clicking the button works, target groups, fading, effects. I even have a linear progress bar here that's totally shader based, meant for UGUI. It works fine. I'll just enable it here in the hierarchy so you can see what that looks like. So I'm pretty happy with this outcome and I'm pretty happy with the WorldSpace UI in general. If you have any thoughts about WorldSpace UI, what you'd use it for, what's working, what isn't working, if you found anything, please drop it in the comments below. Other than that, that's as far as we're going to go today. Join us on Discord if you feel like it. Hit that bell. There's a new video every Sunday. Drop a like, drop a comment. I'll throw another video up on the screen. Maybe I'll see you there.